As business owners, we are constantly making mistakes, but there is one mistake that will absolutely doom us to failure. We're gonna dig into this mistake today with our special guest in hopes of helping you avoid it. Hi, I am Tim Fitzpatrick with Rialto Marketing where we believe marketing shouldn't be difficult all you need is the right plan. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Really appreciate it. I am super excited to have with me today Colin Jewett from Curiosity Jump and the Superhuman Academy. Colin, welcome and thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to dig into this, man. I know when we uh, when we initially met several months ago, we had a great conversation. I really love what uh, what you're doing with Curiosity Jump and Superhuman Academy. So. I think you got a lot of value to share and I'm, I'm excited to dig into this. So um, before we jump into it, I always like to just kind of ask an icebreaker type question. So let's, this will help us get to know you a little bit better. What's, what's one of your favorite hobbies? It's going to sound super corny, um, <laughs> but I'll, honestly true. It's, it's how I spend most of my free time. It's learning. I just love to learn new things, um, whether it's new languages, just random skills. Uh, right now I'm actually taking financial advisor courses, even though I, I don't really care to be a financial advisor. I just want to learn the content. So yeah, that's kind of my, my weird hobby. I just like to learn new things. Hey, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. So I'll tell you one of my core values is constant learning, right? Like I, somebody told me early on uh, in my professional career, the day you stop learning is the day you die. And that always stuck with me. Um, so I'm right. I'm right there with you. I've never considered it a hobby, but it is part of my being. Um, so I'll tell you, one of my favorite hobbies, especially here in Colorado, is mountain biking. I love mountain biking. Just gets me out. It's it's getting. It used to be very quiet. Now it's becoming a lot busier when you get out there. So I find myself going earlier and earlier. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful hobby to have here in Colorado. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm a big fan myself. You probably can't tell in the stream, but I've got my, I've got my share of scars on my face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I face planted into a boulder going at like 20 miles an hour a few months ago. Uh, yep. Just happy to, happy to not have too much surgery for that. <laughs> yeah, it's that's never fun. You know, I um, I the older I get, the more I slow it down a little bit because I'm I've just gotten to that point where I would rather be safe and be able to continue riding than get injured and have time off. Cause when I have to have time off for an injury, it drives me freaking nuts. Um, and mountain biking is definitely one of those sports that if you, uh, if you don't watch it, man, you can, you can take some pretty bad spills, but, uh, it's fun and it helps keep me young. Let's put it that way. Um, so, Dude, let's start off. Tell me a little, let's share your backstory here. Cause when we originally met, you shared with me, you know, your, your, your college experience and really your college experience really led into what you're doing now. Um, I think it's a really interesting story and I think people can learn a lot from it. So to share that with us if you would. Sure. Yeah. That, that story is um, probably gives some background to why my hobby is learning now too. So I think yes a good tie-in and um, I'm not doing what I, I went to college for, but uh, I'm doing what I'm doing because of what happened in college. So yep. a little bit about that. So I went to Purdue University to be an engineer. I uh, got my industrial engineering degree, but I almost didn't. So sophomore year, uh, well, freshman year, I was struggling hardcore. I mean, I I barely scraped by my freshman classes. Not a good sign. in <laughs> really get easier um, so freshman year barely scraped by uh, i figured i'd turn it around sophomore year that didn't really happen either so i was still really struggling and for me i think it was a shock because i'd always breeze through school like high school was easy for me i got straight a's without really trying too hard i never really learned good study habits because i didn't need to i just kind of remembered things yeah uh, once i got to college that didn't work and so sophomore year, I was like, all right, you know what, I'm, I'm going to actually do what you're supposed to do. I'm going to put in the hours and hours every night studying for these exams weeks ahead of time. I did all the right things. And I was still pretty much failing. I was right on the borderline, essentially, of having to drop out. Um, 
And so I got to the point where it was kind of rock bottom and I sent this infamous email, changed the course of my life uh, in a really interesting way to my academic advisor just saying, hey, I'm going to fail out of school. And I don't know what to do about it. I'm trying everything I can. I'm doing what everyone tells me I should be doing to learn faster and it's just not working. And so she sent me to the Disability Resource Center. They told me I had testing anxiety you know, all this stuff, you know, uh, and they gave me extra time on exams. And that's, you know, that's typically w w the best you're going to get from that's their solution. Yeah, right. You'll, you'll okay. more time. It did help. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it definitely helped a little bit, but, um, I knew personally I needed something more than that. I needed to actually learn how to learn. Um, and school had just never taught me that. And, and the solutions that I was getting from the people around me, these so-called good students and, um, the random YouTube videos I'd find about how to study just didn't cut it. Um, and so I stumbled upon Superhuman Academy, uh, Jonathan Levy's courses, um, his Super Learner Masterclass, all about meta learning and how your brain really works and how to take these ancient techniques. I know it's kind of a buzz phrase, <laughs> but it's true. And these techniques that have been around forever and then pairing that up with cutting edge neuroscience, psychology, behavior design. Uh, to actually learn how to learn and learn faster. And so for me, that tr that changed everything. I went from being nearly a failing student and studying constantly all the time, doing everything I was supposed to be doing to get good grades, to studying, I don't know, maybe half the time. And this was just as I was learning these skills and being on the dean's list uh, my senior year. And I went from having no job prospects, essentially begging for internships to getting a senior level engineering position straight out of college, uh, which, you know, that, that was mind boggling to me. I even, you know, finished a book. I wrote a book uh, while I was still in college, published that when I graduated. And so my life completely changed from in a short span of a couple of years from learning how to learn. And uh, I guess to get to where I'm at today, uh, Curiosity Jump is, is my personal brand. It's my personal business. I'm an accelerated learning coach and Superhuman Academy. I work very closely with them now. Uh, that's in Jonathan Levy's company. And we teach uh, students and professionals how to reach their personal and professional goals, no, no matter how audacious, through accelerated learning. I love it. There's a couple things I want to pull out of this. So one of the things you said I think is really important, you know, going back to a lot of these these principles that you learned you know they're they're based on old things right and one of the things that we talk about from a marketing standpoint is is the fundamentals the fundamentals are so important in any discipline and they don't change so it's how you learn man the, the way you learn it's the same today as it was 50 or 100 years ago. Those principles, those fundamentals don't change. So I think the fact that they're old, doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, you know, and so you guys are still teaching these things. The other question that I wanted to ask you was how, when, so you, you became exposed to these, these fundamentals of how you learn. Um, how long did it take you after diving into these fundamentals to really start seeing things shift upward rather than on that downward tra trajectory that you were on? Oh, yeah. Uh, for me, it definitely started to change instantly. Um, it wasn't like I got the full effects instantly or anything like that. And I'm always still learning, uh, of course, not just learning new skills, but learning how to learn. And that's yep. one of the things I love about what I do now is I'm really on the cutting edge of how to use our brains effectively. And I'm personally exploring that and researching that all the time. Uh, but when I was first learning these skills, it really did start to change immediately. Once I just got a basic understanding, hey, here's how your brain works on a very general level. Here's some simple things that you can do, um, types of information that your brain likes and types it doesn't like and how to convert information from the things that it doesn't like to the things that it likes so you can consume them faster. Um, those basics changed things for me right away. But I can say like, you know, within three months, I was a different person. And that's how you can change your life. I mean, faster than that, but, but that's what it was for me. Are the principles that you guys use the same, no matter, you know, like you hear people talk about, well, I'm a, I'm a visual learner or, uh, you know, I'm an auditory learner. Do those 
do those change or are they really the same? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, and I did write an article about that a little while ago. So maybe I can share it in the comments to this video or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, we'd be happy to put that in the show notes. Uh, I think a lot of that stems from some common misunderstandings. Uh, so when you're going through school, just on the auditory learning, because I hear that all the time, I'm an auditory learner. Yeah. Um, and I think a, a big reason why people think that way or feel that way, the, the truth is you learn through all your senses. You know, all your senses are important for learning and, and you can incorporate them, um, but some are stronger than others. So our visual memory is stronger than our auditory memory. And that's true for almost everybody. It might, yeah. it might be true for every single person, but it's true for almost everybody. The reason people don't feel that way a lot of times is because when you go through school, what's the format? You're sitting there and you're getting lectured to. Yeah. So you're constantly training your brain. You need to be listening for specific types of information. And so it's not necessarily the best way to learn. It's just the way that people have been trained to learn. Um, but it's not necessarily the most effective. So yeah, there are some general principles that apply across 99.9% .9 of people that are far, far more effective than anything that you've ever learned in school. If, so tell me a little bit more about some of the things that you guys do at, at Superhuman Academy and with Curiosity Jump. I mean, what, what, how are you, what are the details of, of how you're helping people learn better? Yeah. So to get into the nitty gritty uh, a little bit, um, you know, like what my, my day job looks like or what I'm doing, uh, I'm constantly engaging with students and professionals. And first we want to identify what is it that you actually want to do? Um, I know that might sound really basic, but a lot of times people haven't really answered that question. And um, not to get too deep into the weeds here, but your reticular activating system, it's a part of your brain. Yes. You've, you've probably heard of that. Uh, it's kind of a, people talk yep. a lot in the mindset space. Like it's, it's important. If you don't know what you're looking for, you're not going to find it. Yes. So I'll give you a perfect example of this reticular activator concept, right? My, a year ago, my wife and I bought a new car. All of a sudden we buy that new car. We start seeing that same car everywhere on the road. Yep. Oh my God. You know? And so it's that reticular activator just puts that at the top of your brain and then you start looking for it and magically you start to see it all right. Yep, exactly. So yep. yeah, one of the, one of the early things that we do, first of all, we help people to uh, really identify what it is that they need to be looking for. Um, and, and that's a trainable skill within itself is how to identify what information is important and what information is not important. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I've spent a lot of time working both with students and professionals and, you know, prof professionals, just somebody who has been a student for a long time, most, <laughs> most of the time. So they've kind of been through the same, same patterns. And one thing I see a lot is just because of the way our school system is structured, um, you're trained to, prioritize information that's going to be on an exam or yes. something like that. you get out of school and that's not the case anymore. And so you don't know how to discern between what's important and what's not important. All of a sudden you don't have somebody telling you, Hey, here's what's on the exam. Here's what you need to study. And so people get really lost and they end up spending a ton of time on things that don't matter. Yeah. So teaching people to cut through, cut through the crap, so to speak, and get to what's important. And that's part of it. Um, a lot of it is also just training people. Here's how your brain functions. Um, and, and based on that, here's how you should feed it information. Here's how you should treat it. It's kind of like we give people an owner's manual for using the brain. And okay. it's really important because if you think about it, the brain, the human brain is the most complex thing in the entire universe. And you're just expected to kind of figure out how it works. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get it eventually kind of thing. And it definitely helps to have some guidance. Um, you get an owner's manual with your toaster. Um, it's, you might as well get one with your brain too. It'd probably help. Yeah. I, you know what though? Us guys don't usually read the owner's manuals anyways, do we? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it, it's frustrating because, you know, I feel like the brain is as a, a, the best supercomputer in the world. And most people are using their, they're using Microsoft paint, you know, on yeah. their supercomputer. So you might get, you go through school and you might learn how to draw the most beautiful Mona Lisa and Microsoft paint but you're still using Microsoft Paint. Let's figure out how to use everything else that's at your disposal. Yeah, so you get, you're you really helping people understand how they can use their brain more effectively. Exactly. Cool, I love it. So 
Let's talk about this mistake that uh, that I kind of hinted to in the beginning of this. What's this critical mistake that uh, a lot of small businesses out there are making? Right. So um, I think the title of this, I think you called it the 90 billion yes. mistake the U.S. companies make every year. Yeah. So the U companies in the U.S. spend at least at this point, roughly 90 billion dollars a year on training, training new employees, everything like that. And the training for the most part is, is really ineffective. Um, and I, I've got reasons to kind of back up why I'm saying that, but yeah, comes, absolutely. First of all, people don't know how to learn. I mean, that's, it's kind of why we're here and, and what the dilemma is. So you have people who don't know how to learn creating resources and training other people who don't know how to learn on what they should know. And so you've got all these are areas of inefficiency where you're just losing information. So that $90 billion that's being spent, how much of that is actually converted into an ROI? Yeah. And so I think it's very low. <laughs> yeah. At least it could be a lot higher. And so when you've got these massive companies training people, you know, they're more robust. They have way more points of failure that they have to go through before the company crashes to the ground. Small yeah. businesses can't afford what really large businesses can. If you're making mistakes in your training, or if you're not maximizing your training, um, that might be the mistake that puts the nail in the coffin for you. For a lot of a lot of small businesses that are just starting, if you're a single person, you own a job. You don't necessarily own a business. Once you start to grow that business, you're going to have to bring other people on. And if you don't yes. know how to train them effectively and they can't learn effectively, chances are you're going to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super important. So how do we how do we, how do we train better? Right. How do we, how do we avoid making this mistake? Cause every, I mean, look, every company out there is doing training in one way, shape or form, whether it's training their, their people that are on their team or frankly, I mean, there's a lot of companies doing training to clients, you know, or prospects. So how do we, what can we do? How can we do this better? Yeah, exactly. So what people are investing in, it's really good. It's really important. You need to invest in training, obviously, like investing in education is one of the best things you can do. However, if you don't invest in learning how to learn, if you don't invest in meta learning, the value of that education is not even close to what it could be. So, yeah. you know, just from my personal experience and what I've seen with clients and people I've worked with, the average person can learn 12 times faster than they they think they can or they start out learning. You know, after you've gone through all the way through college, high school, whatever, you can learn at least 12 times faster than you can at the point where you finished your education. And the skills that you have when you finish your education are, you know, the, the way that you're using your brain at that point is the way most people use their brain for the rest of their life because they don't know any better. And, and that's not their fault. I mean, no one's really teaching this stuff except for us and a handful of other people. Yeah. You know, so it's a small group. But I would say that's that's what you need to be investing in, not just investing in your education, which is critical, but make that make that investment more valuable, get higher returns for that investment by investing in learning how to learn. Is there, so one of the things I could do is when new people come on the team, they go through some of these things that you guys are teaching as part of that process, right? Okay. Um, I love that. Are there also ways that we, when we do train, we can train more effectively, right? So the whatever the, the medium or how we train is going to help people retain that information or learn it better. Are there ways that we can do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if we, if we look at some basics and, um, you know, it's a little tough to communicate over a podcast just because there's, there's a lot of fundamental, uh, knowledge that kind of comes into this and how you can execute it really well. But, um, one thing to realize is stories are really powerful. Yeah stories um, and examples um, just giving people. So, you know, one thing I've seen at, at several companies, I hear people talk about how they were trained this way all the time. They show up on their first day and their boss hands them essentially just a giant textbook and says, read this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. That's great. But this person has come through our education system that person is going to forget at least 50% of everything they learn within like a day. 
Yeah. So you're telling them to read something, first of all, which is boring. Uh, if things are uninteresting, they're way harder to learn. So I, I think a common, uh, a common theme with companies is they try to make things really, really professional. You know, you want your stuff to look really good, look really professional, use a really proper language. And so, you know, it's very like, it's everything's written like a research paper, right? Yeah. Very scientific, very precise. Unfortunately, that's not really how your brain processes information effectively. Got it. For most people. Um, so using pictures, using visuals, um, hands-on learning is really critical. Yeah. Especially, you know, blue collar jobs, typically blue collar type companies are the most effective at training because they do a lot more hands-on learning. Yeah. That should be the case with a white collar job as well. There should be a lot more hands-on training than there typically is. Giving somebody a textbook is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. So you had an episode a little while ago, which I loved, which was talking about how to bring, how to find all stars and bring them onto your team. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. But what happens when you bring those all stars on your team and you don't, you don't have anything to unlock their potential. They have a ton of potential that could bring so much value to your business, but you don't have the training in place. You don't know how to help them to unlock that potential. Yeah. See that they're not going to perform as well as they can. And they're going to go somewhere else eventually go somewhere that can help them to unlock that better. Yeah. And small businesses can't afford to be having that kind of turnover with those all-star key players that you bring on. Got it. So let me make sure I've, I've got all this stuff right here. So when, there's a few ways we can train better. One is just initially giving people some of these tools that you guys utilize so that they learn how to learn better. Okay. Two is using stories examples to really solidify these points. Um, we need to keep it interesting, right? Nobody wants to sit down and read this white paper or have you run through a freaking slide deck um, <laughs> and hands on whenever it's, it's possible. Let people learn by, by doing. Yep. Hands on visual and also um, it might be a little bit hard to communicate this, in a short period of time, but I'll do my best. Uh, personal, hey, cool. <laughs> personal language is really key. So uh, one thing that uh, I think it's a real shame, but happens in school all the time. Uh, your professor has a certain way of talking. They have certain, just their vocabulary means something to them. However, if you were to, you know, go into a room in front of 10,000 people and you were to say the word dog, every single one of those people would have a different visual in their head. They know what you're talking about but it's something different to them. There's a slight nuance. They picture the dog that they had when they were a kid. They picture something yeah. small, brown and fluffy, or they picture something like this, you know, a giant Rottweiler. You know, they all have these different Im images that come naturally to them. If you're not aware of that, or you don't think about that, it's really going to affect how well that a communication works. And so identifying what things mean to different people is really important. And so that's, that's the idea of personal language. Everybody has a certain vocabulary that they use in their heads. And so the closer your vocabulary is to the person that you're talking to, the easier communication is going to be. But there's a, the, the two people have extremely different personal vocabularies, personal languages. And if that's the case, the communication is going to be terrible and the person's not going to learn very fast. And so what happens in school is you've got a professor who's teaching and there's some students in that class who have a personal language very similar to the professor. Things just click and they make sense to them. And you have other students where it's very different and it makes no sense at all. Yeah. Sitting in the same classroom, they have the same professor, he's saying the same things. For some people, it makes no sense and some people it does. Um, so like I said, that's a little bit difficult to communicate how you can, <laughs> how you can make that, uh, implement uh, that idea well in your business, but that's, that's important as well. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. So, uh, Colin, thank you for sharing this stuff, man. This is, uh, I, I've learned a lot and I know other people will as well. Tell me, um, I, we're, we'll put up your websites here in a minute, but uh, just so people understand, like if they, if they love what we've been talking about and they want to dig a little bit deeper and start to learn how to learn better, when, they, when somebody works with you, when you coach with them, what does that engagement look like? Yeah. So typically, uh, and this will change based on, like I said, it always matters. What are, what's the end goal? Yeah. Shift completely how we do things because it, it needs to be customized to the person. 
Um, but a really, really standard example would be, you know, a three month engagement. Uh, we'll connect either with an individual or with a business uh, and we'll look at what their goals are and then we will help them to develop training and we'll help to you know teach the people how to learn uh, over the course of that time and, and three months is just the timeline it generally takes people um, to learn a lot of the skills that we teach and to implement them effectively and, and feel like they don't need as much hand holding anymore yeah that's, that's why that time period is there um how much time are they investing each week over that three months on average? Yeah. yeah, that's so if we're working with individuals, it's typically 20 to 60 minutes per day, uh, four to six days per week. Okay. So pretty standard. If we're working with a business, it, it could it could be totally different depending on what we're doing. If we're developing training for them, uh, if we're training executives, if we're training employees, it, it can be different. But And with one-on-one -on -one coaching, what what are the what are the price ranges looking like for that three month engagement? Yeah, there's a huge <laughs> there's a huge variety there too. Um, yeah, but, yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot, but it would help people. I think if they had a general idea. Sure. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna range from the mid hundreds to usually less than ten thousand. Um, okay. So that's the reason there's such a huge range is because that goes from essentially tutoring students. Yes. Working with with executives. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. So on the business side, if you're working with an executive and really putting together programs that they're going to use within their business, there's a lot more intricacies and details there that need to be hammered out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Got it. Cool. I love it, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to share this stuff with us. It's been eye opening to me. Um, where can people learn more about you if they, if they like what we've talked about? For sure. Yeah. I would either check out uh, superhumanacademy.com or curiosityjump.com. Those are both the places you can find me the most easily. Um, I'd also recommend if you, you found any of this interesting uh, for your personal use, we have the Superhuman Academy podcast is a really popular one. It's got 300 episodes. There's massive amount of content there. Cool. And then more recently, the Superhuman Playbook podcast is a, is a good place to hear more. Awesome. I love it. And just so people know, Curiosity Jump is your company. Correct. And within Curiosity Jump, you are coaching and teaching the, the, the principles and of Superhuman Academy. Is that right? Yeah, right. So Superhuman yeah. Academy kind of provides a lot more of the infrastructure. Got uh, it. Director of coaching for them. Uh, okay. It's my personal brand, but I've got, you know, I've got some other things that goes on over there. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Colin, thank you so much for taking the time, man. This has been fantastic. I know people are going to get a ton of value from this. Um, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Again, I am Tim Fitzpatrick with Rialto Marketing. If you want to gain clarity on where to focus your marketing efforts right now to get the best return, hop on over to our website at rialtomarketing.com. That's R-I-A-L-T-O marketing.com. Just click on the get a free consultation button guarantee you will get a ton of value from that call and walk in and walk away with some clarity on where you need to focus right now. So thank you for tuning in till next time. Take care.